Welcome to First Do No Harm with Massachusetts Citizens for Life board member and physician, Dr. Mark Rollo. This broadcast will focus on medical ethics from a Catholic perspective and address abortion, physician-assisted suicide, contraception, natural family planning, IVF, healthcare proxy, and other topics. Please be advised that this show may not be appropriate for children under 13. Hello and welcome back to First Do No Harm, a show about medical ethics from a Catholic perspective. I'm Dr. Mark Rollo. Last time I discussed that Massachusetts is in serious jeopardy of becoming the 12th jurisdiction in the United States to legalize assisted suicide. The death lobby uses euphemism to cloak their evil intention. They speak of death with dignity, compassion and choices, medical aid in dying, and end-of-life options. But we already have the ethical end-of-life options of hospice and palliative care that care for people until natural death. Suicide is not dignified for the victim or the society that allows it to happen. It is certainly not dignified for a physician, a healer, to become a killer. Choice is an illusion for the poor, minorities, marginalized, and those with disabilities who will be steered toward suicide by profit-minded insurance companies and deficit ridden government. True compassion literally means to suffer with rather than end the life of the suffering patient. As assisted suicide opponent Wesley J. Smith has said, we must not allow pro-assisted suicide activists to euphemize then euthanize. No one knows the dangers of assisted suicide better than Stephanie Gray Connors, international speaker regarding life issues and author of the recently published book, Start With What? Ten Principles for Thinking About Assisted Suicide. Last time I played part one of my interview with Stephanie Gray Connors. Today I will play part two. And you will hear many inspiring stories of encouragement and hope rather than despair and death. Let us first, as always, begin with prayer. For as stated by the U.S. Catholic bishops, only with prayer, prayer that storms the heavens for justice and mercy, prayer that cleanses our hearts and souls, will the culture of death that surrounds us today be replaced with a culture of life. O God, we thank you for the gift of life, We ask you for the grace to never reject that gift, but rather to embrace each moment of life in spite of and perhaps because of our suffering. St. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ on behalf of his body, which is the church. Lord, help us to embrace our suffering and dying, especially those final precious moments of life when we have a chance to reconcile, to say goodbye, to forgive and be forgiven. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A palliative care volunteer once stated, Relieving suffering is, for all of us, our primary duty. But denying that it can have meaning falls under the failure to provide assistance to a person in danger. This quote comes from an excellent book entitled Euthanasia, Searching for the Full Story, 
experiences, and insights of Belgian doctors and nurses. In this book, the point is made that people who work in palliative care know that a request for euthanasia is often a cry for help, and that in most cases, once the person's suffering is actively listened to, taken seriously, and solutions offered, the request for euthanasia usually disappears. In our death culture, radical autonomy has become the fundamental value to be respected rather than life itself. As a result, death has increasingly become the solution rather than the solution of true compassion, which again means suffering with. When life is the priority, especially meaningful life, life that knows the love of someone joining with the sufferer, solutions for suffering can be found. In a world that has embraced atheism and hedonism, suffering is seen as pointless. However, suffering is an unavoidable part of life, whether it is physical, mental, existential, or spiritual. In part two of my interview with Stephanie Gray Connor, she makes the point that it is finding meaning in suffering which enables one to live until natural death. Suffering, she says, unleashes love. Now, part two of my interview with Stephanie Gray Connors. I love the fact that your book deals with lots and lots of stories. And the other side is uh, who are pro-assisted suicide are famous for stories that try to uh, evoke um, a lot of sympathy. And they do. They do evoke Mm -hmm. sympathy. Uh, And oftentimes, uh, we on the other side respond with with just uh, didactic sorts of uh, arguments, which d- really don't grab people. And uh, so your your stories, as as uh, I went through it, really does uh, grab you. And um, like a- an example to start with, uh, you referred to Viktor Frankl, uh, mm. who was a psychiatrist and a Holocaust survivor. And uh, he wrote, of course, uh, a book fairly famous called uh, Man's Search for Meaning. And then you brought an interesting little formula that said D equals S minus M. Could you maybe amplify on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a little mathematical equation that Dr. Frankel came up with Mm -hmm. to convey the sentence, despair is suffering without meaning. Yes. And so D equals S minus M was to impart the idea that all of us get S, all of us have suffering. If we're human, we will suffer because it's that universal human experience. But his point was, we don't have to despair in light of our suffering if we can find meaning directly connected to our suffering. And so to the extent that we find meaning in and through our suffering, then our experience of despair will go down. But if we find little to no meaning in the suffering we face, then our experience of despair will go up. And so what he would then say is we need to help people search for meaning in their suffering Mm -hmm. so they don't despair. And really his phrase, you know, man's search for meaning um, is another way of saying start with what, because Mm -hmm. when you search for what good can come out of a bad situation, you're really looking for meaning. And Dr. Frankel himself provides a very powerful example of a teenager in Texas who had been in a car accident Mm -hmm. and became a quadriplegic. And he said, let me tell you how she spends her days. He said she watches the news, she reads the news, listens to the news. And whenever she comes across the story of someone who's suffering, going through hardship, maybe some natural disaster, a fire burned down their home or a tsunami hit their village, whatever the issue is. He said she calls for an assistant to come to her Mm 
to place a stick in her mouth because, mm-hmm. of course, she can't move her limb. Right. And then she uses the stick to pound out letters on a keyboard in order to write notes of encouragement to the people that she had read about in the news. Oh, that's amazing. And Dr. Franco said, that young woman lives a life of profound meaning exactly. and purpose. It's not that her life lacks suffering. Of course she's yes, suffering. She was yes. independent. She's no longer independent. She can't move her limbs. There's so much she can't do. But her ability to empathize, to connect, inspire, and provide compassion has been heightened because of her own experience, and therefore, in acting upon that drive to be compassionate towards others, she's actually tying meaning in directly to her experience of suffering, and that's why she's not despairing. Right, and you kind of you speak more uh, about that in a uh, subsequent chapter, um, where you make the statement that suffering unleashes love, mm. and that really grabbed me because uh, my own mother is uh, 99 years old and she's in a assisted living facility and she has dementia and she's Mm. not communicative and uh, she cannot move at all about the only thing she can do for herself is take a sippy cup with a straw pick it up and take a drink Mm. Um, and that's about the only thing but she appears to be content happy and the other thing is she unleashes so much love from her caretakers who are Mm. all around her another example um, that uh, came to me was I was taking care of an adult uh, mentally retarded individual who was in his 30s big guy and his sister took care of her like a baby and she was Mm. such she was the most amazing holy woman and Mm -hmm. it was the suffering of her brother and her own suffering as a result that that helped make her this incredibly holy person and i know you've you've Mm -hmm. got your your own examples uh, in your book sure yeah but it's it's the, the both of those are just very beautiful and very powerful and um that that idea that suffering unleashes love you know it comes from actually St. John Paul the Great, who in Mm. a little letter he wrote called Salvafici Dolores on the Christian meaning of human suffering. It was within that document that he said, suffering unleashes love, and in a sense, man owes to suffering um, the love that comes as a result. And if you think about it, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas defined love as willing the other's good. And you know, if we were to ask someone, you know, when do we step outside of ourselves, our self-centered world, and think about the other and help the other? And isn't it often when we identify another who is in need, mm-hmm. who is vulnerable or who is weak? Maybe it's a child, maybe it's an elderly person, um, whoever it is, it's usually need that causes us to step outside of ourselves and aid another. Well, when someone is disabled, when they're elderly, when they're sick, then that suffering they're experiencing is, is an incredible opportunity for us to step outside of ourselves right. and lighten the load of what they're experiencing. Right. You know, I'll often, when wanting to impart this point to people, use a simple little thought experiment and say, you know, imagine you see an elderly woman walking down the road with a lot of groceries, and they look really heavy, she's walking slowly, and it looks like she might even trip. And I ask people when I present this thought experiment to them, is your first thought upon observing this woman, oh my goodness, look at that old lady, she's such a burden. Mm -hmm. Or is your first thought, oh wow, look at those groceries, those look heavy, that looks like a burden. And of course, everyone immediately recognizes it's the second thought that comes to their mind. So then I say, okay, now what do you do in response to that thought? Mm -hmm. You cross the road, you approach the woman, and you say, hi, that looks really heavy. Can I take some of your bags for you? Would you like to hold on to my elbow? Could I walk you to your home? Mm -hmm. And when we identify the burden, not as the individual, but with what she's been saddled with, namely these groceries, our immediate desire and inclination is to want to alleviate her burden, Mm -hmm. to lighten her load. In a sense, that, you know, minor experience of suffering, one could say, in carrying those heavy groceries, uh, is an opportunity for us to unleash our love. Right. So we need to look at age, you know, getting older or disability or sickness, uh, like those groceries. Someone 
has been saddled with that burden, and that's very heavy. But the sick person, the elderly person, the disabled person, they are not the burden. It's right. their disease and so forth that is the burden. And so when we love people, we should want to lighten the load and look at how we can help right. them and, and make their lives better. Right. That's why I get, I get so um, offended when I see these euphemisms like death with dignity, with the thought that, as you bring out in the book, you know, what is dignity? And um, right. is, uh, is somebody being dependent? Does that make them undignified? Is someone lacking control of their bodily functions? Does that, which can create some embarrassment, does that uh, make a person undignified? And um, uh, how would you bring that out some more? Mm-hmm, yeah. So that's, you know, when we hear the those who support assisted suicide talking about a death with dignity, it's inherently implying that if you don't choose assisted suicide and therefore you die naturally with, you know, maybe soiling yourselves or, mm-hmm. or drooling or needing the aid of another, that somehow you've lost dignity. And so the point that I try to get across is, Dignity is something that we have by virtue of who we are as members of the human family. Mm -hmm. Uh, As people of faith, we would say as as individuals who bear the image of God Almighty. And therefore, no matter what happens to us, as our body decays, as it breaks down, as we become very needy, we don't lose our dignity. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the response of others is an opportunity to affirm the dignity that is there, even as external parts of us seem to be fading away. And so I think we, you know, there, there's a great actually simple little story I use in my book that I think illustrates that point. I had come across a news article from several years ago, a woman who had owned an apartment in Europe during the Holocaust fled. She basically locked the doors and left, but she continued to pay. It was either a mortgage or a rent for decades mm-hmm. until she finally died and her estate was bequeathed to someone. And when those people entered the apartment that hadn't been entered in in decades, Mm -hmm. it was like stepping into history and walking into a museum. And this had been a very wealthy woman. So there was a lot of antiques in the apartment. There was a lot of art. And there was one piece of art in particular that when, you know, a number of people started going through her things, they thought, oh my goodness, this actually looks like it could be worth a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And they, they had it appraised and realized it was some famous piece of art. And I think it sold for like over a million euros wow. or something. Oh, wow. um, but I, I bring it up because when her apartment was entered, because it had been untouched literally for decades, mm-hmm. it was dirty, right? You have yeah. cobwebs, there was dust. And so this piece of art that ultimately sold for great money needed to have the dust wiped off. It Mm -hmm. needed to have the cobwebs removed. It Mm -hmm. needed to be, you know, restored. But it wasn't like people looked at it and said that isn't valuable because there's dust on it. Instead, they said that is valuable. Let's remove the dust. (laughs) You know, that is worth a lot of money. Let's remove the cobwebs. Mm -hmm. And so in the same way, when when someone is very sick, when tumors are taking over their body, when, you know, they're vomiting or whatever the, the circumstance may be, our response should be like that of the painting. Oh, my goodness, let me clean you up quickly. Let me help you. Let me wash your face because I see the dignity in you. And I'm therefore reacting because of a dignity that is there as opposed to abandoning with the implication that the dignity was somehow lost. Right. Well, I, I like the way you put it in the book. You, you say uh, human dignity is unconditional, mm. that there's dignity there just because you're uh, human. Um, right. But a lot of people list that as, as one of the top reasons why they want to kill themselves. And when we allow that, when we legalize it, we're basically agreeing with them, saying, yeah, you don't have any dignity anymore. And, right, we um, feed the false narrative. Yeah, and you, you um, mentioned this in your book. The other thing that I love about um, what you mentioned is uh, in Chapter 8, I think it was, you said some of the best things in life mm. come when we release control. And it reminded me of a uh, poll that was done just last year in Oregon. And they ask for reasons why people kill themselves. And the death lobby likes to say, well, you want to have a peaceful death. You don't want to have any pain. Well, actually, pain control 
is low on the list. And it's loss of autonomy, loss of dignity, being a burden. Those are some of the uh, the main things that that people list. And it's and it all a lot of it gets back to control. And you say some of the best things in life happen when we release control. Mm-hmm. And you had a lot of yes. good examples about that. Mm-hmm. You know, that chapter really, in a sense, I got insight from it because of my own struggle with control. I'm mm-hmm. a very much kind of type A person who likes to be in control and have all her ducks in a row. Yeah. And that's not always bad. Um, you know, a lot of people get things done with that type yeah. of attitude um, and disposition. But we always have to be aware any good trait we have can very easily be tipped over into a negative thing. And certainly, uh, while some degree of control can be acceptable, there can be inordinate desire to control. Mm-hmm. And when we become controlling and control freaks, it can cause problems for us. It can cause problems for others. And and it's important to realize that, as I, as I point out in that chapter, look, we all accept, whether religious or not, that no human is perfect. We're mm-hmm. all fallible. Mm-hmm. We're also not prophets who can see into the future. So when we become obsessive with control and about control, it's as though we think we know best and that we know the future. But those two things are actually false. And so by releasing control, taking our grasping, tightly clutched, you know, hands around something and just letting go and being more in a receptive position, the unknown can be scary, but it can actually be very freeing. And so what I do is I compare and contrast two stories of people, one where an individual was very much in control and one where someone wasn't. Mm -hmm. Um, The first individual, many people may be familiar with her name, Brittany Maynard, was a a young married woman who very sadly developed a rare form of brain cancer and had tumor growing. And she was understandably afraid of how this tumor would develop and what it would do to her Mm -hmm. and the physical consequences and the suffering she would go through, natural human reactions. But sadly, her response to those reactions was to choose the wrong path, and that was a path of obsessive control where she and her husband moved from California where they couldn't access assisted suicide in order to go to Oregon where they could access it because she talked about how she wanted to die on her terms, Mm -hmm. um, on her timeline and her way. And and so she was very public about her story, and her death was ultimately very publicized when she posted the day she chose to kill herself, you know, on Facebook about how that was the day she was taking the pills. And the idea was that had she not done what she did, guaranteed it would have been miserable. And we actually can't prove that because Mm -hmm. she never lived out the rest of her natural days. So what I do do is I contrast her story with that of a a young boy from Maryland by the name of Maddie Stepanek. Mm -hmm. Um, His story is quite incredible. For any of your Catholic listeners, I actually first learned about Maddie through Raymond Arroyo of EWTN, and Raymond is part of a committee of people that are opening Maddie's cause for canonization. Yes, I did hear about that Um, tangentially. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. His his story is just amazing, but he was born with a rare form of muscular dystrophy that killed his previous three siblings. Mm. And after he was born, the doctors realized his mom unknowingly had been the genetic carrier of this condition, that she herself would develop an adult onset version of it. And that Maddie, you know, wouldn't have survived beyond birth, except he actually did. And he survived until he was almost 14, which astounded the medical community. But What's most striking, I think, about his story was that when he was about 11 years old, for all intents and purposes, it seems like he was on his deathbed. And, you know, his mom describes how he was bleeding out in different places and, and he was in, in pain. And, you know, the doctor said, look, he's, he's dying and yeah. we need to keep him in the hospital, though, because we want to manage his pain, which we can't do as well from home. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Maddie had this, he was a very spiritual child from the time he was very young and he had mm-hmm. this deep conviction that he had a special mission from mm. God to proclaim the message of peace. And, and he was convinced that he wasn't dying, even though every yeah. indicator physically was that he was near the end. And someone, being a devout Catholic, someone had given him a relic from then Blessed Andre Bassett, who uh, eventually was canonized a, a Canadian saint, St. Saint mm. Andre Bassett, but at the time he wasn't a saint. Maddie had this relic, and so he held the relic to his chest where he was experiencing a lot of bleeding and scabbing in his in his lungs and um he held it to his chest and he said, 
Brother Andre, you need a miracle to be a saint, and I need a miracle to finish my mission. <laughs> wow. And That's amazing. no joke, the bleeding stopped. That's amazing. And then the, the doctor said, oh, you know, this is actually what's going to happen is it's scabbing over, but then it'll burst open and this will be the end. But Maddie was like, no, I, I believe I've been healed. Well, he was right yeah, and amazing. not healed for life, but that so began the next almost, as, as Raymond Arroyo describes it, the three years of his public ministry, almost Incredible. like Christ. Yeah. That Maddie befriended Oprah Winfrey. He was on her show multiple times and therefore was able to proclaim such a beautiful message to mm. millions of people around mm. the world mm -hmm. through that program. Mm. He was on Larry King Live. He befriended former U.S. President Jimmy Carter, who ended mm. up giving the eulogy at his funeral. Wow. Um, and his, his poetry that he'd been writing from the time he was a young boy uh, his poetry was published in several books that became New York Times bestsellers. Mm -hmm. and, and I use his story to make the point to people that the people who support assisted suicide in the face of suffering would have looked at him when he was 11 years old and quote-unquote on his deathbed and said, what is the point of continuing yeah. on? Yeah. Why not just end his life now? Yeah. Why suffer for a few more hours or a few more days or mm -hmm. a few more weeks? Mm -hmm. But the reality is it wasn't just hours, days, or weeks that he had left. It was actually years, and the most fruitful years of his life were what were before him. And right. had he taken control the way Brittany Maynard did, yes. the world never would have known about Maddie Stepanek and the very life-giving message yeah. he had. This concludes part two of my interview with Stephanie Gray Connors. Next time you will hear the third and final part of the interview, in which you will hear more amazing examples of of how suffering unleashes love, which in turn unleashes life. I again invite you to go to Stephanie Gray Connor's website, loveunleasheslife.com, where you can order her book, Start With What? Ten Principles for Thinking About Assisted Suicide. I would also like to remind you that the Massachusetts legislature is considering another assisted suicide bill, euphemistically called end-of-life options. Please call your state representative and senator today at 617-722-2000. Tell them we already have end-of-life options of hospice and palliative care. Tell them you want your doctor to continue to be a healer and comforter, not a killer. Until next time, remember, we should always treat life with care and respect, and at the very least, we should first do no harm. First do no harm with Dr. Mark Rollo is produced at WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Richburg. We are very happy to share it with other networks. Thank you for tuning in to First Do No Harm. Dr. Rollo welcomes your questions and comments. You may contact him at markrollo978 at gmail.com. That's M-A-R-K-R-O-L-L-O 978 at gmail.com. Thank you, and until next week, remember, first, do no harm.